Garment. Anybody remember when you exchanged a garment of praise for a garment of heaviness? Hallelujah! Anybody still got a garment of praise on here? Hallelujah! Mm. Hallelujah! Amen, amen. Praise God. This is what I dance to. This is what I shout to. This atmosphere is going to be my forever eternal climate. Hallelujah. God still inhabits the praises of his people. God loves thankfulness. We ought to thank him for where the food comes from. Everything we wear, everything we possess. Amen. Giving us all things that pertain to life and God in us, through the power. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, why don't you turn to some people, amen, five people that you don't know, and shake their hands and say, I'm glad I'm feeling what I'm feeling. Hallelujah. I'm glad I know what I know. Hallelujah. Amen. We're glad to have all of the guests tonight. Hallelujah. Good to see Sister Leah in the back there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Praise the name of the Lord. God's a good God. How many believe He's great, greatly to be praised? Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Amen. What a mighty, mighty God we do serve tonight. Hallelujah. I'm really glad that God chose you. He said you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Hallelujah. This is God's varsity team right here. Come on. This is God's first choice. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. And we are just thrilled to have, amen, everyone in the house of the Lord. Amen. I do give high honor to all of the ministry that are here. Their wives, tremendous wives that God has given them, working behind the scenes. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to have revival in this last day. We're going to see the outpouring that has been promised upon God's people. If God said it, it'll happen. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. They shall speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. I love God's positive promises. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He said, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. Hallelujah. His counsel shall stand. Hallelujah. Amen. And we are truly born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. Hallelujah. God spake everything into existence. He said, I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Hallelujah. Everything visible, invisible, was created by the spoken Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And in the New Testament, it shifted from just merely reading the scriptures to God filling a man with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. And every man, let me add, every woman, every teenager, every young person has got to press their way into it. I say if you want something, you've got to press your way into it. Hallelujah. And I'm glad it's worth the effort. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. God gave you the power to do it. He's still a rewarder of the diligence. Hallelujah. Amen. See, I feel so much pressure. Well, why don't you just press back against those spirits? Why don't you just push back and just shout a little while in the house of God? Come on, somebody. Come on, we need some men that say, devil, you, you went far enough. We need, come on, we got women living for God. Saying, devil, you ain't going to take my step. You're not going to take my crap. You cut that in a moment out of the stuff. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. And we're born into this by preaching. 
Somebody preach to me I could have the Holy Ghost. I believe it. I got it. They told me if you get baptized in Jesus' name, he'd wash away all your sin. I believed it, and I got a clean conscience as a result. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're going to bring to this pulpit one of the greatest apostolic preachers. Hallelujah. At this end time. Amen. We have had church. Young men have preached to us today. Amen. If you missed that service, you need to tune in and listen to those messages. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Kyle Charles and, and Brother Joel Carricker. Hallelujah. Amen. They preached. Hallelujah. How did young lady get the Holy Ghost speaking with her? Standing right over there. Come on. God is in this place. Brother Buxton, we love you. I want you to take your liberty this evening. Everyone say, God bless Elder Buxton. Praise God. Well, somebody said amen. Somebody with the Holy Ghost shout hallelujah right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You ought to just worship God to make the devil mad. Let him know I got the Holy Ghost. I remember a number of years ago that that um, my wife and I were in the city of Fresno. We were at a meeting, and it was obvious that there were some people there that night that had never been to an apostolic church. And um, we were <laughs> we were we were sitting in the middle section, and there was a very tall, distinguished Asian man that was in the service, and uh, I mean the classic Asian, and uh, bespectacled and just classic. In front of him was a classic apostolic woman that had been delivered from bondage delivered from other people's opinions and and I, I watched the Holy Ghost begin to move in that move in that church and she she got to shouting she wasn't shouting pretty she was she was shouting and her arms were going and one of them arms got loose and hit that, hit that distinguished Asian gentleman right in the face. And, and, his, gla and his glasses just went like that. And he was wide-eyed and somebody next to him just turned over and said, Well, welcome to Pentecost. Hey, welcome to Pentecost tonight. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, tell them what God's going to do in this tabernacle here tonight. Amen. Some of you may wonder how come we're running and nobody's chasing us. Yeah, we're, we're running because we have been delivered from the bondage of this world. So thankful for his goodness. Man, tremendous preaching we heard this morning. Thanks to both of those tremendous men that preach the word of God. And for all of you who have made the sacrifice to be here tonight, may God richly, richly, richly bless you. I do feel that the Lord would want to talk to us again tonight. And some of this may be a little bit of a rehash. Maybe. In fact, I heard a couple men today say that, say that I got on their notes last night. Well, they got on mine this morning. So turnabout's fair play. <laughs> Praise God. Not enough thanks can be said to Pastor and Sister Charles and this incredible church and then the visiting brethren and ministry that is here tonight 
my friends, God bless you. I got a dear, 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 dear friend, which is Paul Elder, who, I don't know, we have been, we've been friends a long time. I'll just say it that way. Probably longer than before the Dead Sea got sick, we've been friends. And, uh, and, uh, and it's always good to be with him and his good wife. And then I, I saw their little daughter slip in here tonight. It's so good to see her. All my friends, thank you. Thank you for your kindness towards us. Thank you for the way that you worship God. How many's enjoyed the food around this place? Jesus, have mercy. And uh, Lord, have mercy. If, they got, if they're going to feed us tonight like they fed us last night, I'd come here if I was a monk. I'd be showing up in here just to eat and, uh, and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Anybody happy tonight? Happy. If you have your Bible, turn to me the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 12. I'll let you get your Bible. Look over on your neighbors. Make sure that I'm, I'm reading right. Genesis 12, beginning in verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, watch this, Get thee out. Everybody say, get out. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Watch this. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Watch this. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And, watch this, and in Thee. Everybody say me. <laughs> and in thee, catch this, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Everybody say me. And in, and in me. I want you to understand tonight the incredible potential that resides in you. I want, I want to be very, very clean clear and very plain tonight that inside this tabernacle are young men and young women that have unbelievable potential. Potential so much that God is allowing us to understand if we can connect with Him that because of you all the families of the earth all 8 billion people in this world can be blessed. People that don't know their lineage, people that may not understand who their dad is or where he is, people that may have come up on the rough side. Come on, you don't talk to me. I was born in East L.A., and that's not Lower Alabama. That's Los Angeles. You hearing me? In Thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Savior, I pray the anointing of the Holy Ghost tonight. I pray your anointing on our mind, our spirit. I take authority in the name of Jesus. Let unction and anointing flow in this tabernacle. Remove the scales of flesh from our eyes. Let us see into the realm of the supernatural. Let us walk in holy places. Oh, God. Let us embrace our destiny. Let us embrace our calling. Let us embrace our identity. Reveal to us, God, who we are in your kingdom. I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. Would you clap your hands into him one more time before we're seated? Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. 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 Woo. You may be seated. The scripture is, is not just a collective books of historical fact. The word of the Lord is a living organism. It is God in print. It is the fingerprints of divinity upon humanity. When we talk about the Bible, we are talking about that God who allowed himself to be printed, recorded. In the Bible, when we hold the Bible, we are fulfilling the request of God when he said, handle me, touch me, feel me. The Bible is the love letters of God to his creation. Inside these black-backed pages, we find that we find the heartbeat of God, the personality of God. We find embedded in these pages history. And we are allowed to understand what brought us to where we are. But equally in these pages, we find definition of where we are. We also find an understanding of where we are headed because we find the timeless God written in ink. When a God who was and is and is to come. We find inside this book the Alpha and the Omega. We find the beginning and we find the end. And it is all encapsulated in this book that we call the Bible. The scripture, when we begin to read it, especially in its beginnings in Genesis, we find that there is a familiar character that begins to rise from the pool of humanity early in this scripture, whose name is Abram. When we begin to read about Abram, we find that there are many things that are reference to Abram until ultimately he's being called the father of the faithful. We find that inside Abram there are divine promises that God makes unto him. Not only promises, but covenants. We find that Abram was such a man that God said, I will make covenants with you. I will not just talk to you. I will not just bless you. But I'm going to take it a lot further. And I'm going to make vows to you and, and covenants with you. So that they are not just going to remain in your lifestyle. And in your lifetime. But the covenant that I'm going to make with you will be an everlasting covenant. And it is going to endure throughout the generations. When we study about Abram, we find that he was not just a, a, a blessed man, he was a wealthy man. The Bible talks about Abram and talks about his wealth. It doesn't just say that he was wealthy, but he said, the Bible says he was wealthy in gold. But it doesn't just say that he was wealthy in gold, it says he was exceedingly wealthy. He was a man that had cattle. He was a man that had oxen. He was a man that had sheep. He was a man that had camels. He was exceedingly wealthy in silver. When we talk about Abram, we're going to talk about a man that was prominent in his society. He was not a man that just lived in the hood somewhere and nobody knew who he was. He was not just somebody that drove the proverbial hoopty like I did in L.A. He was not somebody that just tried to find a place of acceptance or, or get jumped in somewhere in, in, in a group of people. But he was a man that was prominent in his society. When you spoke the word Abram, everybody knew who you were talking about. He was a man that everybody esteemed to be. He was a man that people looked to as an example. 
that I want to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And if I can find some way that Abram got his blessing, I want to pattern my life after Abram because I want a blessing. Can I preach this for a few moments? As far as uh, the society was concerned, he had arrived uh, according to his peers. If we looked at him today, that dude was rolling on 20s before anybody was. If we looked at him in today's society, he, he, he was filthy. He was rich. He was blessed. Uh, he had it all together. He was a man that if you looked at him, you would think uh, all he's got to do is enjoy the labors of his hands. Uh, God's been good to Abram. Uh, oh, God's blessed him. Uh, maybe my son can marry one of his daughters, or maybe my daughter can marry one of his sons, and, and perhaps some of that, that familial blessing can come down the chain. It, it looked like from the exterior that Abram had rung every bell. He had, he had pulled every golden lever. He had crossed every T. He had dotted every I. To say that he was living good was an understatement. He was a blessed man. But when we look at him, it's obvious that God was not satisfied where man was satisfied. When we look at Abram, we realize and understand that although he is blessed and exceedingly wealthy, according to Scripture, that in the destiny of Abram, God saw things greater than filled pockets and filled bank accounts and full herds and houses and lands. I would preach to you tonight that God had a greater purpose than Abram even understood. God was not just satisfied that he was blessed. God was not just satisfied that he was wealthy. God was not just satisfied that he had arrived on the scene according to his peers. But the purpose of God was God said, Abram, I could leave you alone and you live blessed. But if you follow me and follow your destiny, I'm going to take you from being blessed to being great. I'm going to take you from a place that you are living large to a place that you're going to be great with God. And I'm going to give you a name. And that name's going to be greater than Abram. That name's going to be greater than wealthy. It's going to be a name that the entire world's going to know. And I'm going to take it step further, Abram, if you do what I'm calling you to do, I'm going to make covenants with you that everybody that blesses you, I'm going to bless them. And if anybody curses you, I got you, baby. I would like to preach to you tonight that Abram's destiny was not in a place of comfort. I want to preach to you tonight that Abram's destiny was not in known situations. Abram's destiny was not in familiar places. I would preach to you tonight that the destiny of Abram could never be described by human existence. That the destiny of Abram could not be comprehended by the Wall Street of those days. The destiny of Abram could not be understood by the family that brought him into this world. I want to preach to you tonight that the destiny in Abram's life was somewhere that was beyond him. It was somewhere that he had never been. I want to preach to you tonight that it was something he had never touched. It was a taste that he had never experienced. It was anointing that he had never known. But as long as he was comfortable in a place of blessing, it, he would never fulfill the destiny 
that God had called him to to, to and that destiny is I'm going to take you from being great uh, to a place uh, where you are blessed. Uh, I'm going to take you from a place of blessing uh, to a place of divine anointing. Uh, I'm going to take you somewhere that's going to be beyond your borders uh, and beyond your ability and beyond your talent. Uh, and if you follow your destiny when I'm done with you, uh, then all the families uh, of the world's going to be blessed. Uh, and more than Abram is going to know the wealth and the glory and the blessings of God. I preach to you tonight. It's one thing to sing and shout inside this house. It's one thing for us to come together on a Friday night. And we know the lyrics. And we know the rhythm. And we know the beat. And we know the song. We know the preacher. We know the men on the platform. We know the people that are playing instruments. Uh, but I want to preach about your destiny tonight. Uh, and I feel called of God to talk to you tonight. Uh, that there's greater destiny than you've even thought about. Uh, there's greater anointing that's ever even crossed your mind. Uh, that God wants to do greater things with you uh, than you could even comprehend tonight. Uh, but I'm going to preach to you. It's not just going to stay locked up uh, inside these four walls. Uh, but God's going to get you out of your comfort zone. Uh, God's going to take you places uh, that you've never been. Uh, and in that place, you're going to find the destiny of the Spirit. I will be very plain tonight. I want to be deliberate in what I am preaching. Abram's destiny was not in a place of comfort. Abram's destiny. I want to preach to young men tonight that feel that if you could just get in the pulpit, everything's going to be okay. I want to preach to you. This isn't where life happens. Uh, life happens outside these rooms. Oh, yeah, I'm going to preach this tonight. When God began to call Abram. God began to allow him to understand that your destiny is not in familiar settings. Your destiny is not going to be in experiences that you've already known. But your destiny is going to be beyond you. Your destiny is going to take you places that your mind has never even imagined. Oh, let me preach this tonight. Uh, your destiny is not going to unfold like you want it to unfold. Uh, your destiny is not going to follow the map uh, that you and your own uh, feelings uh, have tried to sculpt out uh, and tried to craft. Uh, I'm going to preach to you tonight uh, that the miraculous always uh, operates outside uh, of the common comfort. Uh, the Come on, the miraculous of God. It always operates uh, outside of known places uh, and known responses uh, and known understandings. Uh, I want to preach to you tonight uh, that if you're going to follow God, uh, you're going to have to understand uh, that the destiny of God is uh, you're going to have to get up from where you are and understand I've got to make uh, myself uncomfortable uh, in the presence of God uh, and go where God is calling me me to go. Come on, clap your hands with me right now. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. There is something greater that God wants to do for you than give you a good wife or a good husband and a good job. There is something that God wants you to do for the kingdom uh, that's more than just making good money and driving a nice car. Uh, I want to preach tonight uh, that the destiny of God uh, is falling heavily upon this house. Uh, and God wants to put his spirit deep in the lives of young men uh, and young women uh, and said, I'm not turning back. Uh, I'm not looking for familiar places. Uh, I want to go where God uh, wants to make my name great. Uh, and do something powerful in me. This is where the youth of our this is where the youth of our churches are right now. I want to preach to you tonight. We've learned how to shout and dance and talk in tongues and run. We've learned how to go from conference to conference to conference. 
and we always return home the same. We've learned how to dress, and we've learned how to walk, and we've learned how to pray, and we've learned how to talk. I'm going to preach to you tonight. And if I can just make it to that meeting, then, oh, it's going to be a great time. But I want to preach to you tonight. Your destiny is not just conference hopping. Your destiny is not just going from one move of God to the other. I'm going to reach to somebody tonight uh, that God's looking down in your spirit and saying you can stay where you are and live a blessed life uh, or you can listen to the beckon of God uh, and God saying you can stay here and be great uh, or you can follow a destiny uh, that's bigger than you are. That's bigger than your imagination. That's bigger than your prayer. And if you're Follow me. I'm going to do more than bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And if you'll do the will of God, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I was living in San Diego pastoring Hilltop Tabernacle, but God began to deal with my life. Give me some time tonight. I won't be done in 30 minutes. You spend more time than that on TikTok. At one setting before you swipe left. God had blessed us. Our church was doing well. We had filled our building. No longer were in financial constraints. Things were good. Can I preach? We were blessed. We we're blessed. I ate where I wanted to eat. I drove what I wanted to drive. Hello. Hello. I had somebody make my suits. I had somebody make my shoes. Can I preach? I had somebody making my shirts. Can I preach to you for a little while? God was good to us. We traveled. We did what we wanted to do. No longer were we under the gun. Church is doing better than it's ever been, ever done. And God started dealing with my spirit about the Philippines. My wife, after a week or two, said, what's wrong? I said, I can't sleep. And I'm pacing the floor. Can I preach for a few moments here tonight? And I'm pacing the floor. And I'm thinking, God, am I going to have to leave San Diego? This is everything I've dreamed of. This is everything I've ever wanted. This is everything I've ever desired. God, the struggle's gone. You've blessed us. Things are good. You've been good to this guy. You've been good to me. But I couldn't sleep. And I lay on my face at night looking at the maps of the Philippines till finally I'm thinking, God, am I going to have to leave San Diego and go to the Philippines after I've just got everything that I've worked so hard for. It wouldn't leave me. I remember the day I told my wife, baby, I'm going to the Philippines. She looked at me. She said, you're doing what? I said, I'm going. What am I going to do? You're just going to hang here till I get back. I remember I bought a ticket. Bought a ticket. I got on, I got on the plane. I didn't know a soul. Didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody when I get there. I was going to an island I'd never been to in my life. And I remember I just got on that airplane. I said, all right, Jesus, me and you. I don't know where I'm going. This is, this is, this is wild. And I got on. And then I got to thinking when I was flying 16 hours across the Pacific, my ADD got ADD. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I'm so, uh, I'm ready to hit somebody. In Jesus' name, you know what I'm saying. And, and, and then I get to thinking, well, when I get there, there's going to be a choir, you know. Because if this is a God thing, you know, I'm going to get there and they're going to say, oh, you know, praise God and all that. And I land. I'm exhausted. It's 20-something hours since I had a shower. I land. I look around. No choir. So I start asking I'm trying to get to the island of Bohol. Uh, where's the plane? They said, sorry, sir. 
We don't fly to Bahol. Well, how do I get to Bahol? You got to fly to Cebu. Once you get to Cebu, you got to get on a boat. I said, all right, give me a ticket to Cebu, and I fly to Cebu. I thought, well, that's where the choir is going to be. Wrong. I get to Cebu, ain't no choir. I said, where's the boat? They took me to the boat. I buy a ticket to Bahol. I get on the boat. Well, when I land in Bahol, there's going to be the choir. You know, you can hear all these stories. I, I land, no choir, nobody, no signs, no balloons, nothing. Now it's about 30 hours since I left. I'm like Lazarus. Behold, he stinketh. <laughs> and I find a taxi. I, I, I get this guy in a taxi, and, I, and uh, I get in. I got my little bag with me, my little roller bag, and I get in the taxi. He said, where are we going? I said, don't know. <laughs> this is God's truth. I said, just take me to the main center of Tagbilaran, and, and so, uh, which is the capital city. And so we go there, and he's looking at me in the rearview mirror. I'm feeling like an idiot by this time. And he looks at me like left or right. I said, go left. I'm driving left now. This is about 30 minutes later. And he's looking at me in the rearview mirror, and I'm not wanting to look at him because I know he's thinking what I'm thinking. This guy don't know where he's going. And I said, you're right. <laughs> Inside, I don't know where I'm going. And I, I, we go till we drive out of town. And I said, turn around. And he turns around and drives all the way back till we go out of the town going south. And finally he said, sir, where are you going? I said, when I know, I'm going to let you know. When I find what I'm looking for, I'm going to let you know. And I'm sitting in the back saying, God, this is a long way from San Diego. I've done what you asked me to do. Now, you've got to help me. I'm feeling like an absolute idiot about right now. And so we head back down to the main, uh, main uh, central part of the town, and I see a hotel called the Metropole. I said, just pull in there. He pulled in. I paid him. I gave him a very good tip, and uh, he was just kind of looking at me when he drove off. You have to understand, I'm weary. I'm tired. I don't have a lot of faith right now. I don't have a choir helping me. I don't have an organ playing. I don't have nobody on the drums. I, I don't have nobody. I'm unfamiliar. I ain't never been here. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to say. And I grab my little roller bag, and I go walking inside this little Metropole Hotel. And, and the lobby was about uh, from that wall to this wall, small little lobby. And I open the door, and I go walking in. And when I come walking in, there was a couple that was sitting on the opposite wall. And I come walking in, and a young man and a young woman that had been married for one week, they stood up, and they come walking to me kind of slow. And they said, are you a preacher? I said, yes, I am. They said, are you a one God preacher? Are you a Jesus name preacher? Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? I said, yes, I do. And we fell on one another's shoulders. That's been almost 30 years ago. I said, wait a minute. How in the world did this happen? I'm going to preach here in a minute. They said, we heard on the radio. You've met, bro. You've met Willina and Judy. You've met them. They said, we heard on the radio that there was a preacher coming, but we didn't know what, where he was coming. We didn't know where he was going. There's 7,500 islands in the nation of the Philippines. You roll the dice and see how many times you're going to land there. We didn't know where he was going. We didn't know where he was coming from. But early this morning, God woke us up. We got up and we went to prayer. Said, we, we came here. We had a few peso. She said, this is what she told me. She said, we went this morning down to the dock and we watched boats un, uh, uh, unload, but you were not there. We went to a little, we went up and down, up and down till we ran out of money. You hear what I'm telling you? She said, finally, we knelt down on the street corner and said, God, if this is you, you've got to put this together. And God said, you sit in the Metropole and I'm going to bring him to you. It was nine hours that they sat 
with their back against the wall. That's been almost 30 years ago and 400 churches later. But God did an awesome work because somebody was willing to get out of a dimension, a blessing, and say, God, I want to know what my destiny is. I am preaching to somebody tonight. It's one thing to shout and dance when you are surrounded by a crowd. But I want to preach about destiny. Destiny that drives you to prayer. Destiny that drives you to your Bible. Destiny that drives you to your closet. Saying, God, if you're going to use anybody... If you're going to anoint anybody, if you're going to work on anybody, do your best to work in me. This is where the youth of this meeting are today. This is where you are. This is what I want to preach tonight. This is not your parents' world. This is not your grandparents' world. This is your world. I want to preach to you tonight. It's a new world. It's a strange world. It is a world filled with the uncommon. It's a time when everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Reality is now being defined. I remember many years ago, 50 years ago, young boys were lying about their age to get into the war so they could get into the military. And today they're lying about their gender so they can infiltrate women's sport. i got to preach to you that stuff that gets me so fired up and gets me so angry that I understand God. We're going to need more than just youth media. Uh, this generation's going to have to embrace uh, who they are in the kingdom. Uh, this generation's going to have to get a revelation that I am a child of God of the 21st century. And we're going to be facing stuff uh, we never dreamed we're going to face. Uh, but i got to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, i got to get out of familiar church uh, and find an arena that the Holy Ghost uh, can get down in my spirit uh, and make me the man or the woman. That God's called me to be. Lift your hands with me right now. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's love him. Come on, let's love him. I'm talking about praying till you're done praying comfortable prayer. I'm talking about praying. Pray until your mom and dad see something working in you. Pray until your Sunday school teacher sees something's moving in her life. Something's moving on him. I need moms and dads to help me pray tonight. There has got to be a shift in this generation. There has got to be something supernatural that pulls us out of our known familiar comfort zones and says, God, something's got to happen inside of my life. There is destiny inside of me. Come on, lift your voice, lift your voice, lift your voice. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. I'm 66 years old. My friends are looking at me cross-eyed. When are you going to stop? When are you going to rest? Uh, why don't you enjoy some of the blessings that God's given you? That there's something in my life that says, God, I don't just want to live a blessed life. Uh, I want you to do something great with me. I want you to take me places uh, that I've never been. Uh, I want you to do something down in my soul that I've never dreamed could happen. Because the world doesn't need a normal youth group. The world needs anointed powerful reality is now being redefined I'm just I just got to be honest with you tonight got to be honest at my age at my age my response frightens me at my age my response to think about what the young men and young women in this world are going through I look in the fresh faces of young men and young women tonight I look across our campuses around this world 
And I think, my God, my God, I didn't have to deal with that. I never had to figure my way through that. I never had to navigate through this. I'm preaching tonight. And I want moms and dads to hear me. The closet's been flung wide open. There's nothing left in the closet. Everything is in our face. I'm going to preach to you tonight. We cannot just play patty cake and we cannot just sing one to another and we cannot just have good church and that get it done. There's got to be a thunder from heaven. There's got to be something that turns us inside out that says, God, whatever you've got to do, whatever you got to do. I want you to do something in my life. We could shout tonight. We could run and dance and rejoice and I'm all for that. But before I leave this place tonight, I want God. I want God. I want God to get us out of our preconceived ideas of what a good Friday night is. I want God to get us out of my comfort zone. God, I want you to touch me in places that haven't been touched in a long, long time. The first of this year, a young pastor by the name of Jahil, Jahil Bankil, who pastored up in the mountains of, of Mindanao, southern Mindanao. You've heard about the stories of where missionaries are beheaded and, and all the ugly stuff, the Abu Sayyaf, which is nothing more than Al-Qaeda. That's Mindanao. I remember standing in a, in a rented room that I rented in a hotel dealing with a group of preachers that were wandering off into false doctrine. I remember it was a showdown moment for the elder when I said, if this is the road you're taking, I will walk with you no longer. You're in heresy and false doctrine. They threatened me with churches. They threatened me with everything you could imagine. But I realized I'm either going to be a man of God or I'm not going to be a man of God. This is either right or it's not right. I remember the Holy Ghost got on me. Uh, this isn't about me. It's about him. But the Holy Ghost got on me in a way that he's rarely got on me. It was nothing but prophetic as it started thundering in the spirit. I remember Brother Jahil's wife. I remember her. Her name is Isa. I remember as she started travailing in the Holy Ghost, sitting off to the side when all of these preachers were ramping up that we're going to go our own way, we're going to do our own thing. And I watched her go into travail for her husband that you don't get tricked. This doesn't get you. It doesn't happen to you. I remember you preached to them. You prayed for them earlier this year. I, re I remember that day when we left. My wife said, what do you think is going to happen? I said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be a big shakeup. But I said, if I can reach Jahil, it's worth it all. If I can reach him and Isa, it's going to be worth it all because there's something powerful in them. They went back to their, their, their own village. It is a tribal village. It's a tribal church. Back to the church they built with their very own hands. Jahil built it with his dad and his uncles and, and his family. He began to realize that if I'm going to do the will of God, then I'm going to have to draw a line in the sand. And I'm either going to be God's man or I'm going to belong to culture. I'm going to belong to society. Long story short, uh, they kicked him out of his church and they kicked him out of the building that he built with his own hands. I told my wife, I'm not going to leave that young couple stuck up in the mountains uh, of Mindanao. I sent him a, a, an email. I said, Pastor Jahil, we're on our way. My wife and I are coming. We flew from the States. We flew to Manila. We flew down to Mindanao. We rented uh, 
a vehicle. It took us, I think, seven hours to get up the mountain. We broke down in the middle of the night. People were freaking out and scared, but my wife and I weren't because we knew we got a mission to do. We got up the next morning, and Jahil said, what are we going to do? I said, you get a building for us. We're going to have church. And we rented a building, and we got in that building early on a Sunday, on a Saturday morning, and we began to preach. We fought so many devils. Let me talk to you about it. We fought so many spirits. Spirits got into a pack of dogs, and they ran up on the platform, and they threw their head in the air, and they began to howl. Baby, am I telling the truth tonight? They howled and growled and bared their teeth and went in circles and I kept on preaching. I was not going to give the devil any attention but in a few moments uh, the Holy Ghost began to fall and people fell out in that dirt floor speaking in tongues uh, as God filled them with the Holy Ghost. Stay with me. As soon as that it was over, the pastor who sat in the back with folded arms got up back in the pulpit behind me and began to mock everything I preached, began to say it's a doctrine of devils, uh, began to make fun of everything that had gone on, not knowing that I could speak the language. Uh, I sat there and I said, God, I am not going to respond to him in public. Uh, I'm going to wait till he got done. And when he got done, I went to him with my Bible. And I said, I say this in the fear of God, uh, but you better be careful what you're doing. You're not messing with with me. You are messing with God. You are messing with the destiny of what God's going to do right here in Maragusan. And if I was you, I'd be careful. We went and got in the van, rented the van, and Pastor Jehiel and his wife said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to pray. Now, before that, early that morning, I told my wife, I said, baby, I would not be surprised. This is Saturday. I said, I wouldn't be surprised. That in the morning, Sunday, we've got a building and got direction. We got the car. We begin to pray. Jehiel said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to pray. This is God's church. This is God's town. This is God's city. These are God's people. We're going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable. Went to town. Brand new building. As soon as you get in town, upstairs, full of glass windows. I said, pull in right here. He said, we can't. It's too expensive. I've already checked. I said, it ain't too expensive for God. And we got the owner on the phone. Long story short, after, after multiple times uh, that day, that afternoon of negotiation prayer, we finally struck a deal with him. When his wife heard it was her church, she said, you better give it to that church. Uh, without giving him one single penny, he gave me the keys to a brand new building. We walked up there that night, and we began to clean it up. And there was 50 chairs in there. My wife started setting them out. Uh, they said, what are we doing with 50 chairs? Uh, it's just to heal his wife uh, and their two sons. Uh, I said, wait and see what God's going to do. And early Sunday morning, we begin to watch as the taxi stopped uh, and motorcycles drove up uh, until every single chair was filled uh, and people were standing around. And the Holy Ghost We just went back a couple months ago and dedicated that church. We bought another hundred chairs. It was standing room only. And the Holy Ghost fall again. I'm going to preach to you. If you're willing to let God use you, if you're willing to get a little bit uncomfortable, there is revival in this world. And because of you, all the families of the world. Come on, let's love him. Lift your hands. Let's love him. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what's in your past. I don't care what's in your background. I'm here to preach to you tonight. There is a destiny upon your soul. God's design tonight. 
to raise up apostolic voices before we get out of here in Garden City, Kansas, tonight. Every powerful apostolic church that's making their mark, you may be seated, I'm not quite done, in our culture, our churches who have embraced their destiny. Please listen to me tonight. It is the embracing of your destiny that gives you authority. I'm going to say that again. It is the embracing of your destiny that gives you your authority. It is compromising churches today who have surrendered their apostolic identity, who have now lost their spiritual authority. I mentioned last night, and I'm going to slap it again tonight, but there is a major war for identity in our society. Everything comes down to identity today. It used to be when I was a child, it was the birds and the bees, but not today. It's bees that want to be birds and birds that want to be bees. It's furries. It's a twisted up society that says if you want to be a lampshade, you can identify as a lampshade. I've come to preach to you tonight that those twisted spirits are trying to take you to uncomfortable places because they know God is interested in revealing to you, uh, your real identity that's going to take you to places uh, of the supernatural uh, of anointing and of unction. Uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, that revelation always produces identity. The war in the wilderness, the war of 40 days and 40 nights with Jesus Christ was a war For his identity. The devil knew that who Jesus was. The devil knew that he was the Almighty. The devil knew that he was Alpha and Omega. The devil knew exactly who that mud man was uh, who fasted for 40 days uh, and 40 nights. Uh, But the devil also knew if I can get into his humanity, if I can get into his brain, uh, if I can get into his emotions, uh, if I can get into his spirit. uh, I know at baptism the heavens were opened uh, and he heard thou art my beloved son uh, in whom I am well pleased. uh, But if I can shake his identity... If I can wrestle from him who he really is in God, uh, he's never going to have a ministry and he's never going to do anything for God. Uh, That's why every single time for 40 long days, uh, every time the devil came to him, the devil said, if thou be, the devil knew if I can shake his identity, he's not going to do his destiny. But 40 days later, he came out of the wilderness uh, and he went to the house of God. And he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he hath anointed me. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, help me. I am preaching to young men tonight that don't come from two-parent households. I'm preaching to young ladies tonight that don't come from two-parent households. I'm preaching to young people tonight that people have questioned who you are, and they're calling you all kind of, I've come to talk to you tonight. There is a destiny in the Spirit that hovers over who you are. This is where the war is today. It is a war for your identity. And of all the things you need to get a hold of before you leave Garden City, you need to get a revelation of who you are in him it doesn't matter where you've come from what matters is where are you going who are you right now what is the call of God trying to do in your life what helped Moses what helped Moses when he was schooled in Egypt what helped Moses when he sat in Pharaoh's courts 
What helped Moses when he was tempted by the wealth of Egypt? What helped Moses when he was taught Egyptian language and Egyptian culture? What helped Moses when he listened to Egyptian mu music? I want to tell you what helped Moses. What helped Moses was somewhere in his life. Uh, it was whispered in his ear. I don't care that you're in Egypt. You're not an Egyptian. I don't care that you're in Pharaoh's house. Uh, you're not an Egyptian. I don't care that you're in his courts. Uh, you're not an Egyptian. I'm going to preach to you tonight. Uh, we are living in a sin sick perverted world but you are in this world but you're not of this world I want to preach to a royal priesthood tonight I want to preach to a holy nation I want to preach to people who have been called of God thou art Peter and upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That pastor that got in the pulpit behind me made fun of everything we preached. That next Sunday morning, every single person in his church was upstairs with us and not one of them have gone back can I have a couple moments right now this world doesn't care I said this world doesn't care there's nothing that shocks them anymore can I preach to you tonight all they want to do is will you love me will you help me will you reach out to me will you believe in me this God that's loving you will this God love me I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, part of the embracing of your destiny is the revelation of your identity you are special you are set apart uh, the hand of God is upon you the good of God is working on you. You're not a wannabe. You're not an almost there. You're not a someday gonna be. You are a destined child of God. The hand and calling and anointing of the Holy Ghost. Put your hands with me right now. Come on, come on, lift your hands. Come on, come on, come on. Society is burning down around our ankles. Come on, keep praying. Society is burning down around our ankles sin and debaucheries on a rampage. I want to talk to young people right now in closing. You cannot get distracted by the storm that's around you. The devil knew in Luke chapter 8 uh, that if Jesus ever got to the shore of Gadara, his hold would be broken. Hence he stirred the violence of the sea to keep him from coming ashore. I'm preaching to young people that's in a war for your soul right now. You've got to push past the violence uh, of your storm. Uh, revival's on the shore. You've got to get there. I said you've got to get there, but to get there, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. And it all starts with go. Get out of your comfort zone, Abram. Say goodbye to your daddy. And your kinfolk. Can I preach to you? Use me, God, but leave me in the youth group. Use me, but use me on my days off. Use me, but use me in a conference. Use me, but use me in a youth meeting. That's what I'm preaching right now. preaching about God saying you can do that 
and live a blessed life. But I've got more for you than blessing. I want to make your name great. And I want to bless an entire world through who you are. We stand in this place tonight. It would have been so easy for me to get into my Bible and preach a message that all of us be throwing our neckties and shouting and jumping and running and dancing, kicking off our shoes and said, man, we did it again in Garden City. But that's not what God wants right now. God's looking for young men that's been hearing the call of God deep in your spirit. You don't know what to do with it. God's reaching a night for young ladies that said, I've gone to school, I've done this, I've done that, but I really don't know what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is tonight. It's in saying yes to the destiny of God. I'll pray when it's not comfortable. I'll worship when I'm the only one worshiping. I'll knock doors when I'm the only one. I'll teach Bible studies when I'm the only one. I'm not going to be silent on my campus. I'm going to reach to other young people that are trying to numb their pain with drugs and sex and everything else in this society. I don't come from a fat preacher's home. My daddy's not a preacher. My mama don't sing. Nobody knows who I am. God does. God said you can waste your life on the rat race trying to find another rat stacking up dollar bills if you want to and be blessed. Or you can say on this last night of this meeting, God, there is a destiny in my life. I don't know what you want to do with me. I don't want to shout off conviction. I don't want to dance away the call of God. I'm really not concerned tonight who sees me weep, who sees me cry. I just hear the call of eight billion people that are lost and dying and going to hell. I need somehow God to find where I'm going to fit in the kingdom of God. Lift your hands with me right now. Would you pray? The restlessness at night. It's not that God leaving you. It's God calling you to your destiny. That how come I can never be satisfied? There's not anything wrong with you. That's just God saying, I'm calling you to your destiny. Anybody can make money in America. Anybody can drive a nice car and live in a nice house. But who's going to hear the call of God? Our world is in such trouble. They're pumping drugs down their body as fast as they can. Now it's legalized in our nation. And all drugs are a counterfeit for the Holy Ghost. It's the devil's counterfeit for the infilling of the divine nature of God in your life. Can I tell you when you're going to be happy? It's when you do the will of God. Can I tell you when you're going to be fulfilled? It's when you surrender and say, not my will. Not my will. Young men, would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voices? Young women, would you lift your hands to God? I don't just want to live a blessed life. I want you to make my name great. Can I tell you in closing tonight that every storm you've ever went through involves your future? Can I remind you tonight that every time you feel opposition, it's the adversary knowing, if I can stop them in the middle of it, they're never going to get to shore. But when you get to shore, that's where the supernatural operates. 
that's beautiful lift your voice to him right now all over this house let tears run down your face it's destiny would you help me real quick parents if you have a young person up in this altar would you come and stand behind your young person real quick real quick let's do this if 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 you don't have a child here would you adopt somebody in this altar this is the generation upon whom the ends of the earth will come mama would you pray daddy would you pray grandpa would you lift your voice grandma lift your voice it's beautiful all over this house. Such beautiful hands lifted. Tears running down my face. Who am I really? Why did you bring me into this world? What's my purpose? What's my calling? What's my destiny? What's my destiny? Come on, Abram, call on God. Come on, Abram, lift your voice. Come on, Abram. Come on, come on. Come on, Abram. Come on. God did not bring you in this world to be burned out. God did not bring you in this world to be abused. God did not bring you in this world to be a repository of drugs and alcohol. You were born with a purpose. You were born with destiny. God wants to do something in your life. God wants to saturate you with this spirit. God wants to fill you with this nature. Let those tears run down your face. You're more than just a number. You're more than just a statistic. You're a child of God. The hand of God's on you. Come on, let it get deep tonight. Let's go somewhere that we've never gone in the Holy Ghost. Let's go somewhere we've never gone in prayer. Let's go somewhere we've never gone in consecration. Yeah. 
Yes, I call of God. 
Yeah. 